I guess one of the things that I'm most excited about is uh, the, the application of image-guided interventions or interventional radiology in emergency and critical care medicine. Interventional radiology uh, involves the use of contemporary imaging modalities like ultrasound, and fluoroscopy, digital, digital radiography, CT, MRI, uh, to gain access to different structures in a non-invasive fashion uh, so that materials can be delivered for therapeutic purposes. It's uh, different than diagnostic radiologists, which, which is what we typically associate radiology with. Um, so interventional radiology is, uh, is image-guided intervention. And uh, there's a lot of applications across the, the spectrum of veterinary medicine, probably the most widely recognized being uh, tracheal stent placement. But uh, a lot of other applications have been uh, have developed as well, and some of those are very relevant to emergency and critical care. I'd say the first uh, would be some of the uh, nutritional interventions that we have available to us now. Over the, over the years, um, veterinary medicine has kind of followed human medicine in recognizing that uh, nutritional support is very important for uh, recovery in animals present on emergency basis that are critically ill. And uh, in the past, we had the we had the choice, and we still do have the choice of parenteral nutritional support or IV nutrition, um, which is generally uh, total parenteral nutrition most commonly, or we had uh, enteral nutritional support or feeding into the gastrointestinal system, and. Uh, it's pretty widely recognized on the human side that enteral nutritional support results in uh, shorter hospital stays, fewer infective complications, especially catheter bloodstream infections, and uh, potentially, potentially improved outcomes, although that one's debatable. Uh, so the, the going uh, philosophy is that if the gastrointestinal system works, then, then we use it. Uh, so most often, practitioners generally feed uh, nasoesophageally, nasogastric tubes are common, esophageal tubes are very common, uh, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tubes are very common, um, and with all these methods we're feeding into the stomach. And it, they generally work very well, however we have a population of animals that are intolerant of or that have specific contraindications to uh, feeding into the, into the stomach. For instance, some of them are vomiting. Um, and if they're going to vomit every time we feed them, then obviously that's not going to get them the calories that they need to heal and recover. Uh, another uh, potential complication would be if they, if they don't have good management of their airway, if they have risk factors for aspiration pneumonia. We don't want to be putting food into their esophagus or into their stomach uh, for fear that, uh, that they will aspirate. So in that patient population, we used to be forced to uh, feed uh, intravenously um, with TPN or PPN, partial parenteral nutrition. Um, and over the past couple of years, uh, we, we developed some new techniques uh, for feeding all the way down into the jejunum. Traditionally, uh, jejunal feeding tubes had to be placed surgically. They were placed uh, at the time of open abdominal surgery for uh, the cause of the underlying critical illness, um, or occasionally they were placed via a uh, endoscopic gastrostomy tube. So. Uh, an endoscopic gastrostomy tube with a J-tube threw it down into the jejunum. Um, and both these methods are more invasive than we'd, than we'd like. J-tubes that become dislodged uh, can result in septic peritonitis for which there's about a you know, 30 to 50 percent overall mortality rate. So these methods, although they, were, they worked, um, the, the complications were significant. So uh, we recently developed a technique for fluoroscopic uh, or fluoroscopy guided nasal jejunal tube placement. And it's something that uh, is, I think is gaining popularity. Um, and I'd, I think the, the value to the practitioners, many of them don't have fluoroscopy and may not be able to place these tubes, but knowing that the, the capability is out there, so when they have those critically ill patients um, that need enteral nutritional support but have contraindication to feeding into the stomach, they could potentially, uh, you know, be referred, have this two place, and even be sent right back. Um, we do a number of uh, a number of those types of interventions in, in our practice, and so with this technique, uh, animals anesthetized, uh, some local anesthetics put in the nose. The whole technique takes about 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, uh, we use a uh, uh, an over the wire technique. So we feed a wire down a flexible hydrophilic guide wire down into the esophagus and into the stomach. We feed a catheter over that tube and use that catheter to guide the wire to the pylorus. 
send the wire across the pylorus, down the duodenum, into the jejunum, um, and then we uh, take out our guiding catheter and pass the feeding tube then over that long wire, take the wire out, suture it in place, and it's, and it's pretty much done. Um, and when, with that tube sitting in the jejunum, they can receive the enteral calories that we think they need um, without the, uh, the risks of aspiration. If they vomit, well, the food's well beyond their stomach, so that's not going to be a, a risk for them. So generally, uh, the population we use this most, most commonly in is the pancreatitis patient. Um, and although the, the technique is a little bit more expensive on the front end, um, enteral nutritional support on a calorie per calorie basis costs about one fourth of what IV or parenteral nutritional support costs. So uh, if our break even point is usually around three days, so if you plan to need nutritional support in your patient for longer than three days, um, they have a contraindication to feeding just down into the stomach, then the nasojejunal tube placement is probably um, a, a nice technique for them. Some animals hate having something in their nose, um, so the technique can be adapted to do an esophagojejunal tube placement, which can be kind of nice because then, uh, as that animal is recovering and they begin to tolerate um, feeding into their stomach, that tube can be just backed up and then they can be fed directly into their stomach. Um, so it's a nice, and they could go home with that type of tube in place. So. It's, a, uh, it's a, a nice new way to ensure that our critically ill patients get the calories they need without putting them at risk for the complications associated with, um, with uh, traditional surgical JD anastomy.